uh, thanks everyone for coming here. And, uh, so you're going to get a double dose of uh, ocean modeling today. So when I first entered MIT as a graduate student, I had to get to my inner office. I had to go through an outer office at Chris Hill, my old friend. Who's there, that's the first time. He's going to he's going to be the second one to tell you about ocean modeling. So here's the outline of my talk. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you some animations right away you know, to show you what ocean models look like. Chris will do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background working in Africa. You'll see at the very end that I think that's relevant to this topic. Um, then I'll get back into the motivation for ocean modeling. Why do we do this? The scale of the storage problem in ocean modeling. Some example science results, some examples of network and storage enabled collaborations. Essentially, all, everything that um, almost all the research that I've been doing since I've been here at University of Michigan has involved network and storage enabled collaborations. And the reason is that the supercomputers we run these models on, they're, they're federal supercomputers, so NOAA, Navy, NASA. Uh, it was kind of funny when I was negotiating my start of my chair who was a geologist who apparently knew very little about computing said oh what do we have to give you for you to do all your work and i said if you gave me the entire university of michigan supercomputer it wouldn't be enough so um, i'm just going to have to do my research and collaboration with uh, others outside although i should say the local resources are really useful for small <laughs> i just realized since Karen yeah. said, the local resources are incredibly Incredibly useful for relatively small projects that grad students are going to work on. One of them right now, for instance, is simulating the tsunami from the impact that killed the dinosaurs. So that's like, you know, a 100 core problem, a small problem. Uh, and the, the resource, stepping out, sorry. Uh, and then I'll end with some more on Africa. Okay, so I'm going to show a bunch of animations. So I'm actually going to start by first showing this. Um, this full screen is not that easy. No. 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 So I have a green thing. It's not that green thing yet. Oh, great. Chris always knew more about this stuff. Um, so, this is what an atmospheric model looks like. Um, so, this is showing column integrated water vapor. The orange is precipitation events. And you see lots more clouds in the tropics where it's moist. These things here are vericlinic eddies that are spinning off of the jet stream. Um, anyway, there's lots more I could tell you about that, but this is most about the ocean. So the point is that at, you, you need an atmospheric model to run an ocean model, and it's the, the bottom of the atmospheric model that really matters for the ocean because you're exchanging heat between the fluids and you're exchanging momentum. So the wind stress is obviously going to create lots of motions in the ocean, including the currents that I'm going to show you. So you need an atmospheric model, and, uh, and then you can get the atmospherically driven oceanic motions, which I'll show you here. So this happens to be the Department of Energy ocean model. There is a DOE program in the area, I think so. Uh, the Department of Energy is one of the leaders in this kind of modeling. So this is a, a DOE model. It actually was ran on a Jap. Ja this particular simulation was run on a Japanese. Um, so uh, so this is the colors are temperatures. So you see the warm temperatures in the tropics, the cold temperatures in the poles. If you look carefully, you can see the seasonal migration of temperatures. That's what's going on here. And then you, you, you can kind of see these currents. This is the Kuroshio, which is the Pacific equivalent of the Gulf Stream. This is the Agullis here, and these currents are unstable and they spin off these little eddies. So the eddies aren't really, you know, this is this is about a meter in height. It looks like a mountain of water. It's, it's a meter. Um, so you have these these spinning eddies, and these eddies called mesoscale eddies have a tremendous amount of kinetic energy. Um, and so they're really important for lots of things in the ocean, for energy transport, heat transport. Perhaps most of all, they're important for uh, bio biological activity. If they're spinning one way, they pull the nutrients up, and that's going to give you a lot of productivity. If they're spinning the other way, no productivity. So um, th this is a model of what you call the atmospherically driven circulation. 
and that is the most important circulation in the ocean. But even if you didn't have winds and air sea heat fluxes and rainfall, air sea heat fluxes and rainfall affecting the density, even if you didn't all have all that, you would still have another motion in the ocean, and that's tides. So here's a model of the tides. This was done when I was a postdoc at Princeton. So starting with this one here, this is the sea surface height. And so you can see the blue is a low sea surface height, the red is a high sea surface height. The tides, of course, are much more regular than uh, most motions in the ocean, much more predictable. And they are, uh, you have these big blobs of, of uh, sea surface height, the length scale of these can be predicted from uh, theory that you learn in your first year as a grad student, and the sense of rotation, they're going this way in the northern hemisphere, can also be predicted from that. Now, um, the ocean is stratified, and so to first order, you might say, let's have a light layer over heavy layer with an interface in between. And so in this model, we put an interface at, uh, I think it was 1,100 meters, if I remember correctly. It was 700 meters, I don't even remember. It says in the paper. Um, and this is showing the waves on the interfacial plane. So these are called internal tides. So what's happening here is that the interface is moving up and down at tidal frequencies. So the physics of that is that, as you all probably know, these tides, which we call the barotropic tides, the better known tides, that move the sea surface up and down, they're also associated with currents. And when the currents go back and forth over a topographic obstacle, such as Hawaii, you can just imagine here's this huge bump, and you have currents like this, that's going to cause vertical motions. And so that's, that interface is therefore going to move up and down. And that's the physics behind what we're talking about here. So they move up and down, and the vertical motions are much larger uh, than the motions at the surface. But again, this is at depth. And so that's why you have to multiply this by a factor of 10. And this was the first time anyone had ever done this. Um, this model actually had inadequate resolution. So these are actually too small. Uh, the first time we did it. Uh, and they have much smaller horizontal scales. So these, these are internal tides. And so what happens is the, the interface moves up and down like this. Now these waves, just like waves on the surface, can end up turning over and breaking. And when they break, that causes mixing, and that mixing can change temperatures and can also be important for biology. So there's a lot of reasons to be interested in it. Another thing is that if you're in a submarine, you care about these things mainly because they affect the acoustics. The sound speed in water is a very sensitive function of temperature. So if you lift that cold water up, or push it down, it affects the sound speed. So therefore, the Navy is extremely interested in this because it affects anti-submarine warfare. Now, uh, the last thing I'm gonna show, oh, I'm sorry, two more things. So this was my movie of the internal ties, but I was working with another postdoc at the same time who was better at making movies. So here's his movie, which is much better known in my community. So he started from rest, so you can see the waves coming out of, you know, and growing over time. And he also chose a more aesthetic and pleasing color scale. So in my field, this is a very famous movie. Um, and it was made by Harper Simmons. And yeah, we wrote two papers, Simmons, Albert, Arbic. That's his, and then there's an Arbic, et cetera, Simmons. We published those in 2004. And part of the reason it was famous because it's visually appealing. It shows these waves filling up. So, so what happened is after he started being this movie, Harper actually became really well known as a community. Whenever people wanted to go out to see, to measure things, they would first get Harper to make a movie, and then they would decide, like they did a whole experiment, basically deciding that this, you saw this beam coming here, they did a whole experiment based on this movie. Um, let's go look at this beam right here. Now, the innovation that uh, I was involved in after that, you know, that was, that was the first ever move, first ever simulation of global internal waves that happened in internal tides. The next innovation I was involved in was to actually put tides and atmospheric forcing in a model at the same time. So that may seem like a small feat, but 
when, when we did those first global internal tide simulations, we only had tides. But of course, in the real world, the tidal atmosphere forcing is happening all at the same time. And so we then, in a few years later, 2010, published the first paper showing that you can actually put tides and atmosphere forcing in a model at the same time at high resolution. So it's in the model all at once. And so I won't get into the details, but you can, you can take the sea surface height and you can split it into two different components, which are called steric and non-steric. I can explain later if you're interested, but in the, in the non-steric one, you see those large scale blobs, that's the barotropic tides. And then the barotropic tides create internal tides. So the high frequency, small scale texture that you see here, that's the sea surface height signature of internal tides. But then at the same time, with the atmospherically driven motions, you have the currents and the little spinning eddies that you see those. So movies like this show that now we have models that have all these features at once, just like real ocean, or maybe not just like. So now I'm gonna go back to this stuff, having done all that. All right, so briefly, because this will be important at the end, I just show this background here. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa, so this is a picture from 1992. I was in rural northern Ghana. I had to teach physics, including electromagnetism, in a town that usually did not have electricity. That was quite challenging. Um, and, uh, but the students, you know, they were just as smart as students anywhere else. They just didn't have electricity or running water. Um, most of the time. Uh, and uh, one thing to note is that, that they were all uh, men here. This this is uh, changing now that uh, there would be more women if we took a picture like this today. But this was the science class. There were women in the school, but there were none in the science class. The, the year after that, there was one of 14. Anyway, uh, the two best students in there were here, these two, Joseph Ansong and Adam Murupilu. And I lost touch of them, most of them, but then many years later, I started getting back in touch with them, and I found out that Joseph was getting a PhD in applied math, studying fluid dynamics with the person at the University of Alberta that I know extremely well. So I ended up hiring him into my lab as a postdoc after not being in touch with him for many, many years. And he's going to play a role throughout this talk. Some of the science results I'll show in this talk are by him. Uh, interesting to know the, the other good student has also done very well. He's now the member of parliament representing that district. Okay, so why do we model the ocean? It's inherently fascinating. There's lots of motions on lots of space and time scales. Um, it's a complement to in situ in satellite measurements. You can measure things in the ocean. That's important, but it's expensive. And uh, you tend to just get measurements at one spot unless you can set up an array of instruments that go over the globe, and then it's really expensive. You can take satellite measurements looking down at the whole ocean, but obviously, in that case, you're only seeing the surface of the ocean, so there's lots of information you're missing. Um, anyway, so so models, you know, they, they do cover the whole ocean, and um, they're not that expensive. And supercomputers are expensive, but not compared to, say, satellites, which typically cost, say, a billion dollars. Um, then uh, the, the ocean has an impact on the atmosphere on a wide range of time scales. You've probably all heard that hurricanes are really, really dependent on the temperatures in the ocean, for instance. Uh, national security, that's, you know, I work with the Navy, there's a reason for that. They care about the state of the ocean. Fisheries management, and then of course we're all interested in global change. So sea level is rising, there's no doubt about that. And the climate is changing, you know, storm surges. So anyway, these are reasons that we model the ocean. So what's the scale of the storage problem? So I'll start by being a little ridiculous. So let's pretend you could actually literally model everything that's happening in the ocean down to the scales where dissipation takes place. So dissipation takes place on millimeter scales. And so if you take the volume of the ocean, which is this, and divide by one cubic millimeter, if you want to be like, you could say, well, this is how many spatial degrees of freedom you have in the ocean. And if you want to continue on this being crazy route, you could say, well, acoustic time scales are a millisecond, and the age of the Earth is 4.6 billion years, so that's how many temporal degrees of freedom you have. 
And then there's seven dynamical variables in ocean models, velocity, thermodynamic variables, and temperature, and the pressure, sorry. So an ultimate computer that could simulate all this would need about five times 10 to the 33 petabytes of storage. Okay. That's assuming a single city. And the CPU and memory demands on such a computer would also be considerable, obviously. So some less fanciful examples, things that we can actually do right now. So I'm gonna talk about the model that I use with the Navy, the high recorded ocean model. This is used by the Navy for predicting the state of the ocean. So we work on developing the model and then it's sent over to another classified building, which I'm not allowed into. And they send that information out to the entire global fleet. Um, and then the MIT GCM, which Chris was one of the developers of, I'm going to talk about output from two particular simulations of these models. So again, they're used for operational applications. These models are both being used for planning a billion dollar satellite. I'm on that team. They are unique in that they contain tidal and atmospheric forcing concurrently. I already mentioned that. So we started that and then um, Chris and Gang followed up on that. And the other thing they did is they have higher resolution. So we were pretty happy with the model with four kilometer resolution of 41 vertical layers. It's, it's one of the biggest models in the world, but Chris and company came along and did an even bigger simulation. So they doubled the horizontal and vertical resolution. And so there's a three petabytes sitting on the NASA machines from this simulation right now, and they're being forced to do lossless compression as we speak. Just going to make it a bit more of a pain to take the information out of it. So, one of our collaborators, Dimitri Metamenlis, is actually right now digging stuff out for us to use before this lossless compression, which will probably be about Monday or so. Now, another twist on all this is the ensembles. So, ocean and atmospheric models are used to do forecasts, and as you all know, non aerodynamical systems have chaos, small errors become amplified. And so one strategy people use is, is they, they take models and they, they initialize them with beta so that you can break what's happening a few days from now, I don't think. But small errors in those observations will amplify and cause noise. And so what they do is they purposely say, well, all the observations have errors. And so they tweak them and they run a whole bunch of simulations in parallel. And you can actually sometimes get a more accurate fair forecast by averaging an ensemble that takes account of this chaos factor than, than if you just run one simulation. But what that means is that sometimes you're running a whole bunch of these huge models in parallel. So for instance, my Navy collaborator who was just visiting me this week told me that their current prediction system requires 260 terabytes of output every single day. So they have 260 terabytes and they use that to monitor the next day's forecast. And of course, ideally, because the journals say you're supposed to keep all your data, you should probably keep all this around, right? But if you generate 260 terabytes a day, that's just totally impossible. So they have to throw, throw all the old information out. And that's actually a relatively coarse resolution that they have not yet doubled their resolution as of now. So it's going to get worse. All right, some example science results. So um, I hope you remember the movie showing the big blobby barotropic tides moving around. So this shows how uh, well they compare to data. Um, so uh, here is our model, the Navy model, and here is what you dig out of satellite altimeter data. So you bounce migrates down the ocean, measure sea surface site, you measure what the tides look like, and you can see that uh, they're grossly they compare pretty well. You can also look in detail and see that they don't compare perfectly well. This is one of our older simulations that uh, is not as accurate as the newer ones. We've come up with some techniques to improve the accuracy. But anyway, this is one of our older results. So notice the sea surface site signal is about 70 centimeters. If you do a high pass on that and dig out the small scales only, then you can make this plot. So if you remember again, the, the blobby barotropic tides create these internal tides on the interface. They have very large signatures at depth, tens of meters, but they do have a small but detectable signature at the sea surface. That's important because you can detect it in satellites. And so this is the satellite measurements of the internal tides amplitudes. Now you're down around one centimeter, but they can measure that. 
And here's the set, here's the uh, internal tides in our model. So again, grossly, you can see they, they're, they're wrong. Okay, so this is the first paper showing that you can actually compare these two satellites. The early papers we did, we didn't even bother comparing them to the satellites. So now we do, and you can see it's not too bad. You can also learn things uh, about what's dynamical processes in the ocean by doing model data comparisons as you tweak parameters in the model. So you don't need to understand all these plots. But this again is that same altimeter plot and just focusing on these two here. This is a simulation in which the Navy, we take the Navy model, we generate the tides, but we don't put any extra damping into the model. And when you don't when you don't put the damping in, you can see that the tides are too energetic. There's too much going on here compared to the observations. And so what's happening in the real world is that dissipation takes place on these scales, which we're not even close to resolving in these global models. And so the point is that you have to put in these parameterizations of dissipation on acting on larger scales. And if you don't do that, then your tides are too energetic. If you do do that, then you get some tides that are closer to, to the observation. So you actually have to put, this is very common in fluid dynamics, you're not resolving the true dissipation, you have to put in a parameterization of the damping, you have to put it in, you have to tune it, and then you can get this better. That's something we learned there, and I also want to point out, are you 20 minutes? minutes or? Uh, 22. 22, okay. Uh, this is the, my Ackerman postdoc. Um, so really briefly, um, once you have the, the tides and the winds in there, then you're creating all of these internal waves and they interact nonlinearly, they create a spectrum. So this is a frequency, spe frequency spectrum of kinetic energy, uh, and the, the black is from a mooring. This is a very famous spectrum in oceanography called the garrett Monk spectrum. So you fill this continuum, the nonlinear actions fill out a spectrum of, uh, over many frequencies. And these are the models, and so what it's saying is that when you go from 1 12th degree resolution to 1 25th degree, you approach the data a little more closely. And so that may not seem like much, but then before we published this, no one believed that we had anything like the spectrum in a global ocean model. So then we said, look, we're actually starting to approach that. And I'll skip the plots on the right. Um, Maybe I'll skip this plot too, except just to say this is a paper in preparation by, again, that African postdoc comparing uh, what's called a vertical wave number, so that scales in vertical frequency spectrum in real data versus Chris's MIT simulation versus our Navy simulation. And you can see they look vaguely similar. Again, just three or four years ago, no one would have even believed we could do anything like that. Okay, so to add real quick, so my own students and postdocs, as well as many climbers across the world, want access to these simulations. The Navy simulation output is held on restricted access computers. It's very hard to get access on that, especially for foreign citizens. So how do you solve this problem? Uh, obviously, you need to do network and storage and naval collaborations. So one way to do that is you can make your students and postdocs get a Navy security clearance and get on the Navy computers. As you can imagine, that can take time, especially for non US citizens. Closely allied countries like Canada and that, maybe they'll get on after several months if they're lucky. So that's one way to do it. Uh, interestingly, the NASA restrictions are not as great. It's not as hard to get on their machine. You still have to fill out some paperwork to do that. And then you can look at the MIT simulation that Chris will also talk about. Uh, you can also make friends with the director of supercomputer centers in Canada and, and uh, run uh, simulations on their supercomputer. That's one thing we're doing. And as uh, Sean mentioned, you can also uh, take the output, move it here to Osiris, and, and the world can use it. And, and uh, Sean already mentioned that. So there are several people doing that. Um, so the relevance for science in Africa, though, I'm going to slide on that. So marine issues are important on every continent. Global ocean needs to be measured globally, but there aren't many oceanographers in Africa. And in fact, if you go to the global oceanography conferences, it's very notable the one continent that is not represented is Africa. I know of one large computer cluster in Sub Saharan Africa outside of South Africa. There's probably more, but I know of one. I know the guy who runs it, he's been concerned for a while. But still, that's just one. He claims it's the only one, maybe, right? 
how do you take the brain power of a billion people and, and put them to work on problems that involve supercomputers in urban economy that generally doesn't have them? So the answer is obviously what we're talking about here. Um, so as an example, Joseph Ansong, my postdoc, is going to return to Ghana as a faculty member in mid-July. So the vision that we have is if he can maintain accounts on at least some of these machines that maybe he stole yesterday, no can that you just they won't let people log in from abroad. That's the way it goes. Um, but anyway, if you can maintain some of these accounts, then he can take his students and they can log in and do analysis on cutting edge simulations and write publishable papers at virtually no cost. Uh, why not, right? He knows he knows how to analyze these models. And so I would argue that these kind of things that we're talking about here could be a vehicle for helping to bring science in Africa to a higher level and relative. We've already done the simulations. They can help us analyze them. So to end, ocean modeling is a big problem. Storage is a big problem for ocean modeling. And the stuff we're talking about here would be great uh, for science in general. And I would also argue in particular for places like Africa. Done. Thanks. Questions? What about the networking situation somewhere like that? No. Well, I visit there every year and yeah, for my summer school that I'm running there. Um, you know, the internet is not as good as it is here, but it's, it's good enough to work most of the time. Especially when you're around big research universities. I mean, they have the universities where they're doing research. They tend to have better. I can comment quickly that one of the things we're tracking for high energy physics is the network connectivity between all places of the globe. Africa has been on a curve that puts them further and further behind the rest of the world for the last few years, except within the last year there has been an uptick. So that's hopeful. Um, instead of falling further and further behind, like they're, I think they're currently about 22 years behind the leader. And that was getting worse with time, but now I think there's an uptick and they're actually on a track that will help to close that gap a little. But it's very hard. They don't have good power. They don't have to run the networks with, and reliability is an issue. How are we doing on that? Um, actually, we're leading <laughs> North America, yeah. Coming from a rural area, I'm surprised. But I think rural U.S. is waiting on urban. Yes. Right. No, it depends on which specific thing. I'm looking at major research connectivity. Okay. More quest Any more questions? Okay. Uh, let's make the speaker.